Hello and welcome to the IFS Zooms In. I'm Paul Johnson, Director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and we're back from our summer break. We hope you enjoyed listening to our mini-series on inequality hosted by Samaya Keynes. If you want to learn more about our work on inequality, do visit www.ifs.org.uk forward slash inequality. Now, for today's episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Ed Conway. He's the economics editor of Sky News, but he's also, and more importantly for the purposes of this podcast, the author of Material World, a substantial story of our past and future. I can't recommend the book enough. It is substantial. It's quite a large (laughs) book. But one of my sons, who's actually studying material science, carried it around in his rucksack as we were walking through the mountains this summer, (laughs) reading it as he waited for his old dad to catch up. The hardback. The the hardback book in his rucksack. But that indicates quite how long he had to wait for his rather older and fatter father (laughs) to catch up with him as we marched up the mountains. Anyway, let's move on from there. Um, Ed, the book is about a part of the economy we don't really think about, part of the economy, part of the world, which is the role of materials and in a particular set of materials, lithium, iron, copper, sand, oil. Have I got them all? Yes. God, I know that. Yes, yeah, you yes, do. I salt, salt. Salt. Did you salt. salt? I miss salt. salt. And, and salt as well. Some of those, all of those other than lithium, really been important for a long time time but things we don't really think about very much yeah. as we turn on the ta- turn on our electricity or use our iPhones or look out of the window or what have you perhaps said you can just start by saying why i mean <laughs> having read it i can see why because it's yeah. fascinating but why did you choose to do this I don't, well i mean actually that is a quite a profound question i probably don't know the answer to i mean i so so like you i i spend a lot of time thinking about the world we inhabit through a particular kind of economic, conventional economic prisms, whether it's the macroeconomy, whether it's what's going on with the fiscal numbers. And in a way, this is totally unrelated to all of that. Uh, so to some extent, it just felt like a new prism through which to look at familiar stuff. You know, we talk a little bit about net zero, climate change, the energy transition through economic prisms, Nick Stern, all of that stuff, Nordhaus and so on. But I wanted to try and understand just physically where does the stuff that we use and rely on in everyday life actually come from? And then by extension, what do we need to do or to get or to to convert things into if we want to live a sustainable life in the future? And really, it was just a question of kind of stripping everything back to, to totally kind of first principles and saying, I've got this smartphone. You know, you might be listening on a smartphone. You might be listening elsewhere. But how did this device actually come to me? And there's this great essay, which is within the corpus of essays that, you know, that all economic students should read called I Pencil, which was a famous, I think, 1950s essay by someone called Leonard Reed. Very, very popular, actually, in that kind of Cold War period, because Milton Friedman found this essay and said, this is something everyone needs to read. And basically, it was just telling the story of how a pencil is made, but going through the entire supply chain. It was looking at where the wood comes from and how it's processed, where the eraser comes from, where the metal that, that attaches the eraser to... The, the the lead, all of that. And it turns out that is an incredibly complex story. Very few people actually understand how a pencil is made. And I remember reading this years ago and thinking, that's just fascinating because I didn't know that so much work went into that. And for Friedman, part of the point was there is no single author of this, and that's the magic of the market. Uh, no one in this supply chain actually understands how to make a pencil. They understand their own particular bit. But then the other lesson from it is that these supply chains are incredibly complex and are ignorance, you know, our revealed ignorance in some cases about how stuff is made, where it comes out of the ground, what you have to do to it to turn it into products that we use every day is also quite profound. And I I think that we could all benefit from understanding a bit more about how the stuff we are using every day is made, partly because it comes back to the environmental thing, partly because by not concentrating on that all that much in the past, We've been able to to blind ourselves from the realities of how stuff is made, you know, all of these things from steel, concrete, cement, so on and so forth, even silicon chips. They involve quite a lot of deployment of energy and quite a lot of carbon emissions to get into our hands. And so understanding that is part of the solution to, to start thinking about what we do about it. But secondly, it's quite it's quite magical 
it's really amazing what we can do. And the story of how we make a pencil from all those different parts is pretty magical. The story of how we make silicon chips or solar panels or wind turbines or any of these other things is equally magical. And yet these often, maybe not silicon chips, but certainly something like cement or concrete, these things, you know, we, we don't pay all that much attention to them. We just don't give them much of a second glance when we walk past them in the street. But behind so many of these everyday objects is a magical story that goes all the way back to stuff we get out of the ground. And so part of the book was, I guess, educating myself on all of that, trying to do a bit of a Leonard Reed on all sorts of different products like silicon chips and so on. But part of it was just thinking, gosh, okay, this is an amazing market we live in. And yet very few of the models that I had in my head from economics about how to understand it were all that useful for it. I mean, I, you know, perhaps that's, that's something you experienced as well. It's like this stuff feels intuitively very important, yet as a percentage of GDP, lots of the stuff that I write about here, you know, whether it's copper or steel and so on, it's vanishingly small in GDP. And yet without it, civilization as we know it would cease to operate. So I, I, it was, I was teasing out quite a lot of those questions as I researched it and wrote it. And the more I kind of burrowed into, you know, what I call the material world, the more fascinating I found it. As I say, it's partly just one of these unexpectedly interesting prisms through which to look at familiar stuff. Which, and then you're like, wow, OK, that is much more interesting than I thought. Yeah, and it really is. And actually, you brought out some of the themes I wanted to talk about there, because we could talk about sand, and we could talk about salt, and we could talk about lithium, and all the amazing places you went, actually, to write the book, and pick the stories of you in a huge bulldozer, or several stories <laughs> high, yes. or uh, looking over vast salt lakes, and yeah. um, and so on, which sounds much more exciting than my average day <laughs> spent in front of a computer. But likewise, that was the point, you know, that's why I wrote the book, <laughs> to escape from all that. But one, one of the things that you've just described is the complexity of the uh, supply chains, in, in a sense, and the interdependence of pretty much um, everything. You've got one story in there about how during the First World War, we actually traded with the Germans to get some of the glass to make binoculars that we needed to shoot the Germans. Yeah, it's <laughs> crazy. Was, uh, just quite extraordinary. But I, I, I suppose, to what extent did you do this and end up either reassured or actually a bit scared about the degree to which we are so dependent on such complexity and on our relationship with all sorts of countries who we don't necessarily have yeah. an easy relationship with. I mean, it's a bit of both in more or less equal measure. I mean, we, we I think because we don't know as much as we think we know about the complexity of these supply chains. I mean, that, I suppose, is a kind of subcurrent throughout the book. And it's, the, book, the book is really a, it's for, for general readers. There's, there's plenty in there, I think, of interest for anyone interested in economics, but it is supposed to be for, for all people. But So I don't labour this point, but I did feel as I was starting to write it and starting to understand this world, this material world, that metrics that we focus on quite a lot at the moment, gross domestic product, or indeed most of the economic numbers we tend to use, are just not very good for understanding and mapping and conceptualizing things like supply chains. You need a kind of a very different set of tools to understand those things. And to some extent, you know, we used to spend much more time thinking about how those things actually worked back, especially back in the early part of, of the 20th century. But nowadays, we just don't really think. We just think things will suddenly turn up. And, and if you need, I don't know, chlorine, there will be enough chlorine. If you need carbon dioxide, there will be enough carbon dioxide and the market will take care of it. And often it does, but it does often it, it does by having to, to, to push prices up quite a lot, having to induce shortages that are very uncomfortable for everyone. And wouldn't it be good to understand these things a little bit better in advance rather than only being shot by them afterwards. There's this episode uh, that happened in the UK where we where there was a fertilizer plant that shut down and we suddenly ran short of carbon dioxide and everyone suddenly realized that was how we killed all the pigs in this country using carbon dioxide stun guns. And suddenly the shortage of uh, a fertilizer plant shutting down, which no one thought that much about, suddenly meant that you had a shortage of pork in the country, uh, not to mention fizzy drinks. After that episode, Downing Street said, oh, hang on, we just had no idea this was coming our way and have now started to try and talk to different chemicals firms about understanding those interlinkages and those networks of reliance. But as I say, they are far deeper than anyone kind of really appreciates. And it's not just that we need products from all over the kind of the constellation of different products. 
It's the fact that many of them come from other countries, some of which aren't necessarily going to be reliable in the future. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But a lot of stuff comes from China. Our dependence on China for many of these products is extraordinary and growing. And that gets to, you know, when you, your question was about to what extent are you depressed, to what extent are you optimistic? I think because those dependencies are so much deeper and so much greater than I think many people even appreciate, that's a cause for, for nervousness, but it's also a cause for optimism because we are both massively reliant on each other. You know, the West and China are enormously, I think, more reliant on each other than anyone fully appreciates for the web and the, the flow of these goods. And so if something goes wrong, if there is another, God forbid, if something happens in Taiwan and there's a rerun of what happened in Ukraine with China, it would be so bad. It would be so bad, but it would be so bad for both of us. And ho hopefully that's something that, that both sides are aware of. You can't, I think that's the other thing. You can't just disentangle these supply chains very quickly overnight. Joe Biden's trying to do something like that with things like the CHIPS Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. But these things take a long time. America's not going to be able to build a solar industry overnight. And so for the time being, if you want to have things like kind of loads of solar panels everywhere, you need China. There's no getting away from it. If you want to have lots of batteries, you need China. And it goes both ways with that, doesn't it? That does sound risky. And I mean, going back to what you say about glass and the, the binoculars, you talk about almost a failure of industrial strategy in the UK, such that we lost our position as a leading glass maker, yeah. ended up completely dependent on Germany. Now, uh, hopefully, as you say, we're not in a world where we're going to go to war with one of our uh, one of the nations that we're um, currently very dependent on. But I, I think you put mm. that there specifically to warn us. That was exactly the situation in, in 1914. We became entirely reliant on Germany for the probably the single most important advanced technology of the age, which was optical glass, because if this was the first war fought at great removes. So if you didn't have optical glass, then you couldn't actually hit the thing that you were trying to target. And that is very similar to today with silicon chips. So these are both silicon technologies that 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 could determine who wins and who loses when it comes to war. And I'm not saying you, we need to, certainly not advocating autarky, but I am advocating that we just understand the current situation a little bit better. And I, I, I think that much of economics, understandably, focuses on price. And But price suddenly can yo-yo all over the place when you suddenly don't have availability. And, and particularly with things that aren't very easily substitutable. Energy, you can't very easily substitute out of. You can just make less stuff and do less. But does that count as a substitute? I don't think so. And we're living through it right now. Ukraine, with what's happening in Ukraine, energy prices in Europe are far higher than they were before. And slowly but quietly, and again, without many people making much of it, that the conventional wisdom here is that Europe has weathered the storm and we've made it through because partly because the weather was cold and partly because we managed to reduce our use of, of energy. The main story about what's happened over the past kind of 12, 18 months is that Europe has deindustrialized at a rate that we have never seen before in order to, to make ends meet and in order to, to be able to survive on the amount of gas that it has. That's happening right now. And it's just becoming more reliant instead on, on America, on shale gas from America. It's going more reliant on stuff that's imported in from North Africa. But for the manufactured goods or the energy? I mean, I, I have to say, I'd been taken in by that um, the manufactured goods. So uh, overall view. Fertilizer is a really good example of this. Fertilizer, without fertilizer, we're all dead, obviously, uh, or most of us. And we just shut down, in the UK, we just shut down the last remaining fertilizer uh, plant uh, in this country. It's actually the same one that they briefly shut down before and there was a CO2 shortage. And that's been shut down now, or at least the plan is to shut that down. You no longer, we're no longer making fertilizer in this country. You've got uh, the place where they invented this process, the Harbour Bosch process, one of the most important industrial processes mm. in history, how we turn nitrogen in the air into a nitrogen that we can put sprinkle on the soil. The, at the very place, BASF, that they invented it, they've stopped making it, and they're now importing it in from the US. So Europe is becoming more reliant on you know, for those some of those base products. And it doesn't just go for fertilizer, it's a good example, but it goes for lots of the chemicals, it goes for lots of raw materials as well. It goes to some extent for car, car production as well. It's becoming less productive there. And that's I think that's part of the explanation for why Germany is doing so badly right now versus most other places. But it's happening across the piece. And it's not especially evident from aggregate GDP numbers because the rest of GDP is doing okay. And again, that's I think that's the, the point of this book. It's to say that even though this stuff doesn't necessarily play an enormous role in GDP, 
it's got this kind of it's got this importance to just our survival as a species, really, as a civilizations that isn't necessarily accounted for within GDP, which I don't know, maybe there's some matrix I haven't yet come across within the economics profession which takes account of this, but I've yet to I've yet to encounter it thus far. And yet it matters, doesn't it? Like instinctively it matters. And I think that's one of the things that I really took away from this in a sense was as a as an economist, my view of what you described that some of the Biden policies to onshore some of the technologies that would allow the creation of um, silicon chips or, or, or solar panels. In, in, in a world of free trade, just looks daft. Makes no sense but, at all. Yeah. But in the world you're describing here, it's sort of, Christ, why didn't we do that before? Because, yeah. you know, at the moment, we're so dependent on Taiwan for silicon chips, so dependent on China for, for, for solar panels and so much else, that if, you know, if something went wrong there... Um, the consequence would be much more dramatic than totally. I think we, we understand. And yet, and yet, I don't know. That this is what I'm trying to understand. I think we're all trying to understand this at the moment. I think that we have, because we were living in a world where we have, you had, you, you had untrammeled globalization, where China had entered the WTO, and you didn't have to worry about where things came come from because they just they kind of showed up. If we're living in a different world right now, then this stuff suddenly it does matter where where your solar panels are coming from. And it's not to say that we are living in that world, but it, it does feel like a very different universe to the one that it felt like kind of only five, ten years ago. When you're in that world, then the material stuff is all important because in a way, like I say, that doesn't that's not there in GDP. It is kind of like it is theoretically it should be there, shouldn't it, in, in kind of input output tables. But that that those kinds of databases are pretty rubbish, the ones that we have at the moment. In theory, there should be a way of making a map of the economy that involves all of those kind of interlinkages, but we, we don't have anything like that. Just too too complicated to imagine. And it's, probably, to some and, it's probably, yeah, and it's probably too complicated. I mean, I feel like you probably could make input output tables with a, that have slightly more granularity than we've got at the moment. But yeah, like it's back to that pencil. If it's pretty much impossible to make a comprehensive map of something as simple as a pencil, then what about a silicon chip? And one of the in one of the chapters of the book, I try to go down some of that journey of explaining where the silicon comes from. I mean, one of the things the extraordinary there is this the I think that's the chapter where there's you, you go to this enormous place in the US, which is the only place in the world that can make the silicon pure enough. Yes. And they won't let you in really yes. because it's so secret. Which, so which is in fact, fact stopped that... again, you know, everything oh, yeah. stopped because no one else knows how to do it. That place is one of those kind of extraordinary kind of pinch points because yeah, they 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 make they make something called ultra pure high quality quartz, I think it is, or ultra high purity quartz, and that quartz is not it doesn't go into the silicon chip itself. So if you're holding a piece of silicon chip, it's you don't have that quartz from that particular place. It's one town in America called Spruce Pine, where there's just a particular geological anomaly that means you've got super high purity quartz. It doesn't go to the chip, but you can't make the chip without it because you need to melt that super pure silicon in a crucible that's only made of this stuff. And it just so happens that the only place that we found that has enough kind of large quantities of that of that stuff is in the US, in North Carolina. So again, that's the other interesting thing about this. It's, it, it is that it's not that China holds all of the cards or that the US holds all of the cards. In certain areas, there there is actually a kind of equality of sorts. In some ways, actually, if you're looking geologically, America has much more abundance than China. China has lots of coal. They've got bits and pieces, but they have n- nowhere near the, the kind of richness of geology that America has, uh, which in the long run is quite important. But that's definitely not the message from the book. It's not to say that geology is everything. But these things are, I think, more important than the conventional wisdom in economics has come to assume because of that fact that the world is in a different place at the moment. The other thing that is great about thinking about this is that it goes from the sort of the very basic digging sand out of the ground or, or getting lithium out of these massive sort of brine lakes yeah. and then leaving it, uh, basically leaving the brine to evaporate just like yeah. they did thousands of years ago to get know, salt out so of the that's, ocean. That's why I love what I love about this is that there's all these echoes. So, you know, yeah, like how we make, used to make salts back in the Phoenician era is how we make lithium 
today. And so we think that we're, we're incredibly modern than we are in many respects, but in other respects, we're retracing the same roots of our, of our forefathers. And it's that combination of the very basic with the staggeringly high tech that yeah. comes together to, to do all of this. And you know, talking about the lithium, which is, as you say in the book, 10 years ago, we probably wouldn't have dreamed of putting lithium among the, the most important elements alongside oil and sand and salt and so on. But now, powers pretty much everything in terms of high tech. We, we, we're all sitting here with iPhones and so on, dependent on that. But another, I thought, fascinating bit of economics, in a sense, is the speed of improvement in a lot of these technologies. Yes. I mean, you talk about battery technologies and how they've yeah. um, just become so... I mean, we all, we all know that chips and so on have got you know amazingly quicker over time, but, but the, the, the extent to which battery storage has become so extraordinarily improved. I think that's, I, for me, that was one of the most hopeful things about, again, looking at the world from a slightly different perspective is that we in our kind of conventional economic world spend a lot of time bemoaning the fact that we're in this productivity slowdown, secular stagnation. Uh, and certainly that's what the aggregate numbers show. But when you're looking specifically at some of this stuff, there are just so many extraordinary stories about how we have improved our ability to make stuff with ever smaller inputs and make it in ever more efficient ways. Batteries are a good example of that because the price of batteries every year has just gone down and down, defying so many expectations. Same thing for solar panels, same thing across the piece when it comes particularly to renewables. And partly that's because when you're looking, I think primarily at kind of manufacturing technologies, and again, because I think manufacturing is not a super... Uh, fashionable, maybe it doesn't get the emphasis that it deserves. But our ability to to get those productivity gains every year is amazing. It's not just, you know, people talk about Moore's law in semiconductors, where every year the, the density of these semiconductors, or every couple of years, the density of semiconductors is going up at an exponential rate. And it is a kind of productivity miracle. However, similar leaps are happening, you know, across the piece in all sorts of sectors that you don't really spend much time thinking about. So, you know, batteries has got a bit of attention recently, solar panels and so on. But something as simple as making car paint and getting the paint on a car has just become better and better as generations have gone by. The We talked about fertilizer a second ago. The amount of fertilizer that we can eke out of the various inputs we're coming in has also got better and better. And you see these exponential learning curves where the cost of something goes down and down over time and we get better and better at making it. It's everywhere, like motors, just simple motors that go either, you know, the big ones that go into cars or just the small ones that are driving a little fan. Again, they get more and more efficient and have done for, for decades and decades. And that's the extraordinary thing. We take some of that stuff for granted, or I think more, more accurately, we're often just a bit ignorant of it. The price just goes down and things get a wee bit better every year. But these advances, which are to me, they, they look a lot like an amazing productivity story, are happening all the time. And I do, I, again, I wonder at the extent to which that's captured mm. within the data or at least within the discourse. Farming is a good example. The amount of effort that we've had to put into, into getting a certain amount of wheat out of a certain hectare of land, the amount of time we've had to work on it, the amount of man hours, the amount of, of inputs we've had to put into it, whether it's fertilizer or the amount of machinery we've had to use, whether it's uh, the steel and combine harvesters, that has got smaller and smaller, those inputs. And the amount that we get out has got bigger and bigger over years. And the reason that we are, we're here in the studio rather than in a field having to plow and work away is because of those extraordinary productivity gains, which are to some extent still continuing every year. And that is, that's a miracle of, of human achievement. Um, again, which I think you get quite a vivid sense of when you're kind of looking at where stuff comes from, how we get it out of the ground, and then what we have to do to it to turn it into stuff that we use. Suddenly they're like, wow, this is amazing what we do every day. And so my hope is that if you read the book, then, you, then you're not just deprived of the challenges that we're facing, which is quite a bit of it, but you also have a sense of, gosh, what we can achieve if we put our minds to it is actually pretty extraordinary. And yeah, I find that amazing. Yeah, and it's true on a on on the micro scale. I mean, the sort of silicon chips that you each transistor is smaller than a, an atom or something. I yeah, not got quite that slightly no, wrong. But they're, measured, they're measured in atoms now. Here's, they're so small. I find this totally mind boggling. They're so small now. Okay, they're measured in maybe a few atoms or angstroms. They're so small that that when they are working they are prone to quantum effects. So literally quantum physics is impacting the flow of electrons 
that are happening around your smartphone right now, the thing that you've got in your pocket. And I find that, again, just it's crazy. It's crazy. that um, we. For me, the most amazing thing about that, by the way, is that when people talk about the wonders of, 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 of human endeavor when it comes to engineering and so on, often they think about these machine things like Concorde, this amazing supersonic jet. And it's like, why have we not made anything greater? Why is it that our planes today are so much slower than Concorde? And, and then Peter Thiel, the, the famous investor, says, you gave us what 160 characters, but where's my flying car? I think, we do, I think we do more amazing things than flying cars right now. Because frankly, with Concorde, and for that matter, with a flying car, very few people get to go in Concorde, get to, ever got to go in Concorde. Tiny fraction of people, I presume, will ever get to go in flying cars. Yet these smartphones that have transistors so small that they are far, they are leagues smaller than a red blood cell. They're smaller than a coronavirus. The size of the transistor is so small that it is literally challenging Newtonian physics as you're trying to move electricity around. And they're in everyone's pockets. They're not just in 0.1% of the population's pockets, the 0.1% who got to travel in Concord. They are everywhere in billions of pockets around the world. That's amazing. That is truly amazing. So it's the fact not just that we've been able to do these crazy things, but the fact that we've been able to mass produce it as well, which is what changes the world. You've got that at the micro scale. I mean, some of the other figures that really struck me were just, I can't remember the numbers now, but the astonishing amount of raw materials that goes into a windmill or a, yeah, was yeah. hundreds of tons of copper, I think you yeah. said, and, and obviously Especially vast the amounts offshore of ones, just steel the, and concrete. The size of the cables that you need to take that, that electricity back to shore is massive. And that gets to, it's a very topical story at the moment because we're struggling to get to, to encourage people to build wind farms. And that's partly because those raw materials, and you said it's, yeah, it's copper, but it's steel, it's concrete, it's all of those other things. The price of basically everything has gone up, which comes back to partly to energy, uh, higher energy, all of this stuff is very energy intensive, which kind of poses some, some awkward questions because that means our cost of renewables is, is going to be more expensive. And that gets to what I think is going to be the uncomfortable conversations that we need to have in the coming years, which is that We've all committed to net zero as, as countries. Many, most developed countries have committed to net zero. The conversation about what it will take to get there, I don't think, has, has caught up with that commitment. In fact, I think a lot of politicians, when they were committing to it, some of them had vague kind of nervousness about how much it was going to cost. But actually, the, the kind of granular detail about what it will involve we're still only starting to fathom that now. And from what we can fathom, it's certainly going to be, it's going to be a massive challenge. I think it's going to be a bigger challenge than pretty much any other one we have set for, for generations, if any. You know, you're talking about wartime uh, equivalents here. And that's daunting, like enormously daunting. It's not to say it's not doable, because it, it is doable, but it, it has a cost and it has implications. And have those implications been spelt out to the people who will have to pay for them, for taxpayers? I really don't think so. And what happens when you suddenly have to deliver that truth to people? then understandably, they're going to be kind of shocked by it. And might you then see a backlash against this? I think quite possibly. And I think the lesson from that, a lot of people would hear all of that and say, oh, God, it's going to be too difficult. I think the lesson really is just we need to be honest and frank from the start about what it will involve to get there. It is possible to get to net zero. It's tougher than anyone could probably imagine. We're trying to compress. These energy transitions normally happen in the space, maybe not of decades, but centuries. And we're trying to compress an energy transition into a space of a few decades. And not just that, every other previous major energy transition, so if you're looking at the transition from wood to coal, from coal to oil and oil to gas, every single one of those has led from a less energy dense fuel to a more energy dense fuel. As you've gone up that ladder, it's got easier and you've been able to eke more out of these different fuels as we've learned how to use them. In this case, we are literally going backwards. We're going down the ladder to less energy dense sources of energy, whether it's taking the wind and putting it into batteries and so on. And so there's a double challenge there that is is massive. But as I say, it's not insurmountable. And if you look back at all these amazing things that we've achieved over time and how we brought costs down of all these things, there's so much to be hopeful about. But what I worry is by by blithely not really thinking that much about where stuff comes from then we might find ourselves hitting up against some resistance when suddenly it turns out that, hang on, yeah, renewable energy might, for, at least for in the short run, maybe not in the long run, in the long run it could be really cheap, but in the short run might well be quite a bit more expensive than we thought it was going to be. That's going to be uncomfortable, I think. And I thought it's very striking what you say about all of that. I mean, I've thought about this 
quite a lot in the UK context. And my view is that the public hasn't been told enough about some of the difficulties within the UK, moving to heat pumps or whatever it's going to be, is going to be a massive transition in its own right. But you put this in the sort of global context in terms of the, this, the, the almost an unimaginable amount of steel and concrete and so on that's going to be required for all the wind turbines, the unimaginable quantities of, of, of solar panels that are going to be required, the fact that we're going to have to have nuclear power stations, which some people mm. don't like. But one of the things that you talk about, which quite often people don't like to talk about, is that a lot of these things at the moment are themselves very carbon intensive and making the concrete, the steel and so on, creates an awful lot of carbon in the first place. Now, you're careful to say that the lifetime, it's still better to make these things than to burn gas yes. to, to, to make electricity. But in the short run, this is pretty carbon intensive business. In the short run, there's a kind of hump. But there's two things, really. There's a hump of we need in order to get to net zero to to do this enormous kind of infrastructure thing we need to make all of the batteries but we also need to make a massive electricity grid because we need to raise the amount of energy we're getting from electricity from roughly 20 percent to maybe 70 percent it all comes from electricity whether it's from renewables and so on and that means stringing a lot more pylons around the country and it means a lot more copper and a lot more transformers and all of these different things which are really kind of material intensive so if when you're building that infrastructure, that is a load more mining you need to do, uh, a load more refining and all of that stuff, like you say, is really carbon intensive. The, the good news is that in the longer run, once you have got over that hump and built a lot of the infrastructure out, then theoretically, first of all, you can do a lot more recycling. Secondly, actually, your impact, your imprint on the planet should go down quite considerably because right now we're having to mine a lot of fossil fuels or we are mining a lot of fossil fuels to, to, to get us the power that we need at the moment. In the future, if there's no fossil fuels, then your total aggregate amount of mining goes down. But our total footprint on the planet kind of shrinks. But to get to that promised land, that's the, this is the thing, to get to the promised land, then you potentially need more of everything because you need more energy, you need more materials, you need more of it all. And you need to try and do it at a cost that is going to be palatable for, for humankind and for people who even now in this country, are understandably nervous about the extra costs entailed that they, you know, no one was told there were going to be extra costs, or at least it wasn't made very explicit. But of course there will, because it's really expensive to build this stuff. We need to do it. Yes, in the very long run, in 50 years' time, we could have far, far more plentiful, cheap energy. But getting there is going to be tough, exciting, but tough. And that's something that none of the political parties want to talk about right now. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's not helped by those who seem to say that we could do this far quicker. Uh, it's going to be difficult and expensive to get there in the next 20 well, years. And, 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 also diff and also more difficult to get there. And this is the really kind of awkward thing. If you want to try and make all of that steel that you're going to make wind turbines out of in a green way, Okay, which so that's that would be the kind of gold standard thing. And you need vast amounts of energy then you need and electricity. Then extraordinary amounts of energy. And if you want to make all the fertilizers we're eating, like I said, we're, we're not making any fertilizer in the country at the moment. But to replace a fertilizer plant with a green fertilizer plant involves crazy amounts of electricity. There's a stat like somewhere towards the end of the book about you. it would take the entire output of Hornsey One, which is the world's biggest offshore wind farm. It would take the entire output of that wind farm just to be the equivalent of what we're producing in one single fertilizer plant, the entire output of the world's biggest offshore. And that's just for a little bit of fertilizer that doesn't isn't even enough for this country, which just underlines the scale of it all and the ambition. Like I say, I oscillate between being desperately depressed by all of this and being excited. Comes across in the concluding chapter. Yeah, I, could, I, could, I couldn't decide at the end of it whether well, to be, yeah. feel positive or negative. No, I don't know. <laughs> and I think some people, some people probably will be going, why couldn't you come out on one side or the other? But that, that obviously, that is real life. This is both things at the same time. It, it's scary. But it is, it is, there's, a, there's a hopeful message there, which is to say that we can do this stuff. And actually, when was the last time that we set ourselves the task of having an industrial revolution because that's what we are doing industrial revolutions in the past they happen more or less organically sometimes imperceptibly but sometimes obviously this time we are setting ourselves that challenge and industrial revolutions are massive opportunities for productivity for thinking about doing things in new exciting and hopefully more efficient ways and so that's you know that may, that could spell a very exciting next few decades but I don't think, given that the understanding of where we are now, this material world we inhabit, is relatively primitive, I think 
we need to get that straight before we then work out where we want to head to. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, I'm, um, you know, I-, I wish I'd had this to read before I spent my 10 years on the Climate Change Committee <laughs> because I kind of had a much better understanding oh, of it all. Amazing to hear. Um, there's one thing in the book that made me really angry, which was when you described, I think it was the, the, the raw material for lithium. You said that Australians deliberately dig it up there and send it to China because in China, it's hugely energy intensive to turn it actually into the lithium we use. But then the um, the carbon dioxide emissions uh, are the Chinese's yes. rather than the Australians. Yeah. I think that's just a, a great example of how we have to think about this globally and how why we we in the UK need to think not just about the carbon emissions we create here, but other carbon emissions we create by what we consume here. And that's not something we focus on very much at all. And I think in a, in a way, that's a sort of story of the whole book. We're consuming stuff created all over the world with all sorts of environmental impacts all over the world. And we're too often, probably arguably not enough focused even on what we're doing here. Mm. But the consequences of what we consume as some of the richest consumers in the world is much bigger than what you know, actually our impact from what we create here. I think that's right. And I think it's the out of sight thing. If it's out of sight, we don't have to much think about it. And we've de- deindustrialized very quickly in this country. And, and, and much of that has been quite positive for us. But the, the, the thing is that one of the benefits of that, if in a purely kind of carbon accounting sense, is that we have we our carbon emissions have fallen very quickly. It's not just that; obviously, we have far more renewable generation, and that's a brilliant part of that story. But part of it is that we just don't make as much stuff and don't have as many of these processes anymore. We've just shut down the last remaining fertilizer plant in this country. That's going to be great for our carbon story. But our footprint, as you say, our wider footprints, isn't shrinking at anything like the same rate. And thinking in those holistic terms, and I think the the only way we can start to think in those holistic terms is to go back to first principles and understand how the stuff we need is made and how it gets to us. And that is what I've done in the book. The only surprising thing to me was, and I only realized this once I started writing, the only surprising thing is like, this feels like such an obvious way of starting to to think about the world we inhabit, and I wish, yeah, I wish that I'd started thinking in that sense sooner as well. But it's it's a start, hopefully. No, absolutely, and a great one. And I think this, this, the point about how we measure our progress on carbon, you say, it's absurd to think the fact that we shut down a fertiliser plant here is in any sense progress because it'll get made somewhere else, quite possibly in a yeah. less efficient way. And yet we count that as progress in our in the way that we target this. But And I think that's all in, in, in itself quite and a... And need to be shipped here as well. That's the other thing. Well, yeah. That's also true. And that, you know, there are much broader lessons there or parallels with all sorts of things where you know, what we target determines what we do rather than what we ought to be doing to determining what we do. Anyway, Ed, we've already spent probably too long talking about this. And honestly, we could we could talk for ages. And I think that the great part about the conversation is it is, as you say, a different way of looking at economics and a bit that because in the way we measure the economy, a lot of this stuff looks less valuable than the legal services or whatever we provide we don't um, we don't really focus on it as as much as we should but as you say without all of these things we simply wouldn't wouldn't be able to get off the ground in terms of living the life that we lead so thank you so much for spending the time here thank you everyone to for listening to this episode of the IFS zooms in to see more of our work do visit www.ifs.org.uk To further support us, do consider becoming a member for as little as £10 a month. You can find out more in the episode description. We'll see you next time. Mm